The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency David Kaboa, President of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency David Kaboa, President of the Republic of Marshall Islands, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Your Excellency. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, let us bow our heads together and beseech God Almighty to let his peace and mercy descend on us all and on our fragile home, the planet. I extend to you all warmest Yahweh, greetings from the people of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Mr. President, I congratulate you upon your election to lead the General Assembly. I also offer sincere condolences for the devastating flood in Libya and the earthquake in Morocco. Mr. President, a strong and effective United Nations is needed now, more than ever. Together, we now face economic shock growing global tension, and intensified climate impacts. Our United Nations was forced to help maintain peace, reduce threats and conflict, and address the economic and social challenges facing humanity. It has also served a useful purpose as a key platform for dialogue between nations. And we acknowledge the strong efforts of the UN system in humanitarian relief and assistance with development goals. Yet, the world is at an hour when, more than ever before, we are falling well short of what the world needs and deserves. Mr. President, the world is now vastly different from that of 78 years ago. The remarkable advances in all spheres of human life has been phenomenal and unrivaled. New advances have facilitated people-to-people -people connectivity and helped to shrink our planet into a small global village. Yet, we are feeling an intense rise of the very global tensions, if not the threat of wider conflict, which the founding members sought to avert. Politics must never blind the need for accountability, not only in Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of Ukraine, but everywhere without exception. Mr. President, every nation in this room including my own, has more to do to deliver on our human rights records. Far greater understanding and direct assistance is needed to better address complex rights situations. Every nation scattered in this hall bears a vital responsibility to protect, not overstep, the voices of the most vulnerable. As a candidate country for election to the Human Rights Council in the term 2025 to 2027, we are firmly committed to strong and credible action and also to listen closely to all perspectives. And we are proud to call attention to the recent endorsement of our candidacy by the foreign ministers of the Pacific Island Forum. Mr. President, the Pacific Small Island Developing States are truly large ocean nations. Before 
we are small island developing states. Oceans are not a distant notion. They are our lifeblood, our economic future, our food security, and our culture. And much of the rest of the world has used oceans as dumping grounds or resource basket for which to take at will without consequence. And now the tide is changing. Pacific Island nations help to set the mark in global tuna markets and affect a transition to sustainability. Our partners are helping us set up with resources, partnerships, and real-time technology to better monitor and patrol our vast EEZs. The UN, UN has now adopted a new high seas cons conservation treaty addressing biodiversity beyond national just jurisdiction. And at a time when nations are increasingly challenged to work together on the bas basics, it is a testament to political will and diplomatic skill in which we have come together to cut across silos and define specific action and obligation to try to better ensure future generations see the same ocean benefits we now uh, we know today. It is our challenge to the world to bring this treaty into force and affect before the 2025 UN Oceans Conference. And today, you have my signature of that treaty to add to the growing course. Mr. President, the world's equilibrium has been upset by humanity's insatiable greed for the accumulation of materialistic wealth and possessions. Today, the Marshall Islands is encountering insurmountable challenges in coping with sea level rise, erosion of shorelines, flooding caused by high tides, coral bleaching, intrusion of seawater into taro and croplands, and the rapid deterioration of the ocean ecosystem. Moreover, the warming of the ocean has affected coastal sustainable fisheries and posed a direct negative impact on our way of life. In some, our islands, our culture, our way of life, and our very existence as a people and nation is threatened. We call for, for the establishment of an international financing facility to provide assistance and support to small islands, developing states, and low-lying atoll nations and territories devastated during and after natural disaster as well as we elements, our elements of ins insulation from external shocks, be it energy, supply chain disruption, food security, global health pandemics, hyperinflation, and other challenges. Mr. President, the Marshall Islands leaders have raised the alarm and call the world's attention to dangers posed by the climate change monster since we became a member of this August party in 1991. For over 30 years, Marshallese leaders, as is the case with leaders of low-lying island states, have sounded the alarm in every international and regional forums. For over 30 years, the world has been meeting and talking about the adverse effect of, of global warming and climate change. We hailed the historic conclusion of the Paris Agreement. However, eight years has gone by and carbon emission levels remain high and the planet is getting harder with each passing day. And as a matter of fact, the Secretary General himself was affirmed, has affirmed that the era of global warming has ended. Now we have entered the age of global boiling. May I again reiterate my humble call for the world to declare war 
on climate change. Mr. President, the future of the Marshall Island and, and all low-lying island states hangs in the balance. The eyes of people the world over are on us in this 78th session of the General Assembly. The Marshall Islands believes that the time for speeches and eloquence of talk is over. It is time for eloquence of actions. Let deeds, not words, be our operating principle. Our own island security is at stake not only by the tension between superpowers, but by rising seas and changing oceans. The world has spent a full generation falling short in our common calls to avoid dangerous climate change. And we are past the hour of waiting for a real step up in ambition. This year must be different. At COP28, the global stock tape must mark the turning point at which we all recognize that we are collectively failing to deliver on the Paris Agreement. And we must all respond by agreeing upon a clear roadmap to correct our course. This ambition roadmap must include the phase out of fossil fuels. The world cannot afford to further ignore the issue at the heart of the crisis. Though we must use every tool at our disposal, we cannot place our hope in dreams of unproven, untested solution, or use updated technologies, or green light the continued expansion of fossil fuels. For the most vulnerable nations, adequate, predict predictable, and accessible finance is crucial, particularly for adapting to prepare for the present and future onslaught of the impacts of climate change and addressing the loss and damage that is already being experienced. We need donors to deliver on their existing commitments and to come together to address the climate finance crisis in a way which is led by the signs and the needs of vulnerable states. These challenges might be inconvenient for large econ economies but I can assure the climate impacts already at our door and those yet to come are decidedly more inconvenient for low-lying atoll states like mine and for other island nations around the world. Mr. President, the United States has not fulfilled its obligation to the people of the Marshall Islands. Resulting from the nuclear testing program on November 25 or 25, 1947, U.S. President Harry S. Truman, in response to concern about the people of Eniwata, who were being removed and relocated so that the U.S. could conduct its nuclear weapon tests, stated, the Eniwata will be accorded all rights, which are the normal constitutional rights of the citizens under the Constitution, but will be dealt with as words of the United States for whom this country has special responsibilities. Our atoll nations were affected, other, other atoll nations were affected, and this obligation likewise remain unfulfilled. The Marshall Island has continued its negotiation with the United States on extending our relationship of free association. We have come a long way in this endeavor, have satisfactorily addressed most issues, and remain cautiously optimistic that our agreements will be finalized soon. However, there remain difficult issues that the Marshallese people have insisted need to be resolved. As a functioning democracy, we cannot ignore the wishes of our people, and as the world's most and preeminent democracy, the United States needs to understand this reality. The Marshall Island desires to continue its free association with the United States, but the United States must realize that the Marshallese people require that the nuclear issue be addressed. Mr. President, the Marshall Islands strongly welcomes the rise of the partners in the Blue Pacific and the support of friends and allies who are committed to working with us on island driven solution. Our early steps together are positive, even as more structure is needed to listen closely to our deepest needs Let's all go beyond the, the headline announcement and into our local communities and move into more focused dialogue with the Pacific and not just about the Pacific. 
Mr. President, the Republic of the Marshall Islands affirms a recent statement by the Pacific Islands Forum Foreign Ministers with regarding the release of treated water from the Fukushima power plant. With other forum members, we remain vigilant and concerned as committed to regular and ongoing discussion with Japan as well as an annual dialogue with the IAEA. Mr. President, distinguished heads of state and government, I appeal to you all, let us work together to strengthen the foundation of international peace and security. Let us then jointly call the UN Secu Secretary General Summit of the future next year to include diverse perspective and voices and to force a watershed moment for peace and security. We have before us all a valuable opportunity to strengthen the pillars of accountability and UN system reform. Together, we can all help ensure the UN is truly fit for the purpose and better aligned with contemporary challenges. The fourth UN sits meeting in Antigua and Barbuda next year likewise is a spotlight moment for island driven solution and strategies. Mr. President, there remains a visible crack in the UN. Our United Nations will never be whole and complete without the meaningful participation of the 23 million people of Taiwan in the specialized agencies of the UN system, as well as in meetings and mechanisms which support the SDGs. Difficult indeed it would be for our UN family to build further trust and prosperity between us while also closing the doors of our organization to Taiwanese journalists and public visitors. For too long, the UN bureaucracy has stuck to a wrongful misinterpretation of Resolution 2758 and has used political influence conclusion to include any clear engagement with the people of Taiwan and their vibrant democracy. We must have the courage to recognize the reality of the present situation and relegate this outdated dogma to the walls of history. Today, the UN can no longer look the other way and ignore the need to actively facilitate peace, stability, and security across the Taiwan Strait and within the region. We commend the Secretary General's commitment for the UN to do its utmost east tension in the Strait and prevent escalation by involving all stakeholders and by logic and common sense. We believe this must include Taiwan. Mr. President, is, is it possible for us to waste peace instead of war? Is it too much to ask that the United Nations declare war on climate change and global boiling, poverty, racism, injustices, and unequal distribution of wealth, the white call between the haves and the have-nots, exploitation of the planet's finite resources? We must help hasten the peace foretold by Isaiah when they say, shall beat their short into block shares and their spears into plunging hooks. Nations shall not lift up short against the nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Thank you and Kumol Dada. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Marshall Islands for the statement just made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency.